In our first video on creation versus evolution, we discussed the different Christians that have contributed greatly in the field of science. Uh, we went over some of the complete improbabilities and total impossibilities of the Big Bang Theory and how it actually vi violates scientific law. In this video, we want to discuss evolution. Now, when most people think of evolution, they think of probably Charles Darwin. Well, there's really two types of evolution that we want to discuss and one of them is actually based on science and that's microevolution. There's what's known as microevolution or a better phrase or term is probably adaptation and then there's macroevolution which is typically known as like Darwinian evolution where uh, monkeys turn into men and whatnot. And so microevolution is a scientific fact. Microevolution is kinds producing other kinds dogs producing different types of dogs, cats producing different kinds of types of cats. That is absolutely proven scientifically. What is not proven scientifically is macroevolution. In Genesis 1.21 it reads, So God created great sea creatures and every living thing that moves, with which the waters abounded according to their kind, and every winged bird according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. When the Bible is talking about a kind, again, it is talking about a type of animal, a horse kind, a dog kind, whether it's a wolf or a German shepherd, it's still a part of the dog kind. Microevolution or adaptations always produce the same kind. There's actually a scientific principle that's involved, and it's a DNA code barrier. And it Basically what that is, is God has put into each living creature that it only has the genetic information available to produce the same kind. And that has never been violated in any area in the field of science, that a kind has never produced a different kind. Evolutionists or non-creationists will actually show some of these facts that are scientific and then what they do is they then switch to macroevolution or Darwinian evolution. This is the apes to men, and cats to zebras, whatever you want to call it. Evolution actually teaches that every living creature evolved from a single cell billions of years ago and every animal transformed into another animal over millions of years essentially. Now skeptics will say that's that's not at all what I believe but essentially that's what it comes down to. You're a cosmic accident that started from a cell that basically transformed or transitioned into everything that we see it now today. So again, if you think about this, you had to start as a single cell in the water, breathing with gills, having to develop lungs, somehow coming up onto the earth and, and procreating with yourself, mating with yourself, and then creating every living creature. And the actual theory behind that is pretty ridiculous. It does absolutely sound absurd, but evolutionists will say, well, it takes billions of years and we can't really trace it today. Well, that by definition makes it not science. Science being the study of things that we can reproduce and we can see happening. So there's a huge problem with that scientifically. In order to be science, again, you have to actually be observable and reproducible. Clearly, the Big Bang, as we discussed in the first video, and evolution are by definition not science because they are neither observable or reproducible. That's why they should be simply called a theory or someone, it's basically an opinion on what they think happened. Are there other scientific problems with macroevolution? Absolutely. Uh, just that there has never been one single discovery of a transitional form where a kind changes to another kind, ever. You've probably heard to it, it referred to as the missing link. Well, the missing link is just stating we see monkeys and we see remains of men, but we do not see the transitional forms where the monkey turned into the man. Now, skeptics will say, oh yeah, sure we do. Look in these books, go to these museums. Well, all you're going to find for transitional forms are pictures or stuff things, basically, in museums. There's no actual, physical, real scientific evidence. And it poses a big problem for those who actually promote these types of beliefs because really essentially that's what it is. It takes faith to believe in all of this. 
that they say, well, there are these transitional forms, but in all reality, there is not. Another problem with Darwinian evolution or macroevolution is that Darwinian evolution teaches that things are getting better and better by adding new and better information. Well, scientific research actually shows us now that there's no viable example of nature ever adding any new or beneficial genetic information. In fact, microadaptations or microevolution, if that's what they want to call it, is actually caused by the sorting or loss of the starting genetic information, not the adding of it. In fact, adaptations can only produce weaker and weaker gene pools. So basically, they breed genetic information out. It's what's known as gene depletion. This again poses a big problem for those who think that things are getting better and better. In fact, on kind of an entertainment level, if you ever watch the movies, the X-Men, they actually, in a way, actually kind of promote this. They talk about evolution or mutations, and they show that these, these things or creatures are getting better, and because of that, they're a newer evolved species or mutation. In fact, the scientific world uses the term mutation now as well. And that's also what's known as neo-Darwinism. It's a newer teaching out there. They're saying mutations create new and beneficial information. They say natural selection lets the mutant take over the population, basically, and millions of years, of course, allows for this, which is something you're always going to hear when you get into this type of belief, is millions or billions of years is what it takes. Well, that's kind of convenient because that means we can't actually see it happening. Another problem with this theory of neo-Darwinism is that all observations of even mutations show that mutations come from the sorting or loss of genetic information, which is actually the same thing as adaptations or microevolution. Natural selection, which is a scientific fact, removes weaker mutations and adaptations that are too weak. So natural selection actually preserves God's design. Natural selection does not cause evolution, it actually prevents it. So if you take this all together, basically what you have is you have the DNA code barrier, which is a God-given barrier that stops kinds from producing other kinds. You have gene depletion, which is what we've seen scientifically happening in adaptation. So you go DNA code barrier plus gene depletion plus natural selection equals macroevolution impossible or Darwinian evolution impossible. In fact, the chances of just one DNA chromosome arra arranging itself is 1 in 10 to the 100 millionth power. And Darwinists need billions of DNA to work. In fact, when you ask them, you know, how could the world ever come into being in such a chance, they say, well, there's, there's so much chance out there, essentially, that it just was bound to happen at one point. So everything that we are now today was because nothing by chance somehow created everything. It's really not that hard to see that when you actually examine the Big Bang Theory and Darwinian evolution that they are indeed scientifically impossible. Darwinists will now say when, if you're asked why there's no evidence, they'll actually tell you something about punctuated equilibrium, basically which states that there's no evidence because it happened over a short period of time, and then there was a long period of time when it wasn't happening, and then later another period of time when it happened over a short time again. The uh, problem is there's no evidence in the fossil record because the real evidence actually has always been an enemy to evolution. And again, just like with the first video that we did on this, we really want to recommend a few really good websites for you to check some of this out. AlwaysBeReady.com, CreationMinistries.org through Russ Miller, and Answers in Genesis will actually give you some real unbiased, good, Christian-based science that's backed by actual scientific facts. So one of the last things that somebody who adheres to this form of science will say, well, what about all of the DNA that we share? We share supposedly 98% of the same DNA with a monkey. According to some research, we actually share 99% of the same DNA as a mouse. Uh, we share, according to some research, 75% of the same DNA as a worm and 50% of the same DNA as a banana. So sharing similar DNA does not mean that we evolve from that creature because no one's going to say we evolve from a mouse or a banana, of course. But what it means is we have the same creator. And as actual science kind of begins to show DNA, there's a chance that the actual percentage of DNA that we share with an ape is not 90-something percent. Some say it's even as low as 70. So 
Either way, it doesn't mean anything other than we have the same designer. Skeptics to this will also point out, they'll say, well, what about all the missing links or the transitional forms that were found and published? Well, the thing about those is every single one of them has actually been debunked. Every single supposed transitional form has been debunked. There was one early in the 1910 that was found. It was called the Piltdown Man. And they said this was definitely a, an evidence of a transitional form. Well, what that ended up in being was a skull cap of a human. It was a jawbone of an orangutan, and it was filed down to fit together. It was then acid treated and buried in a rock, in a rock quarry and dug up. And this was actually found to be a hoax in the 1950s. Skeptics will say, well, what about Lucy? Lucy was a three-foot-tall chimpanzee. Another one called Nebraska Man ended up being a piece of a broken tooth, and they used to reconstruct the entire specimen off of a piece of a broken tooth, and it ended up being uh, an extinct pig is what it actually ended up being. Neanderthal Man was another one that they said was a transitional form. No, it actually was just an old man who suffered from arthritis. So every actual transitional form that they've brought out has been completely debunked. And if you just think about it for a minute, they've come up with five, six, seven, eight, maybe. There should be millions and millions that are easily found. Again, we can find skeletons of monkeys and apes. We can find skeletons of men. We can't find anything in between after all this time and all this digging. That, that should really tell us that they don't exist. Before Darwin ever switched to more of an atheistic, God is not real, or God is real, he's a noble, probably more of an atheistic view, he actually had some things happen in his life that caused him to basically leave his Christian religion of believing in creation. And so Darwin actually became involved in the, in the teachings of a man named Charles Lyell. And this is a man who promoted uniformitarian geology in a very old earth. Lyle's theories were incompatible with Genesis, and so Lyle and eventually his disciple Darwin just couldn't reconcile them, and he ended up basically casting out that belief also after the death of one of his daughters, which I'm sure made him question the goodness of God at that point, which oftentimes happens to people that either have some sort of belief in God, something bad happens. And they Darwin is really well known for the origin of species and the descent of man, and these books actually contain some things that you're probably not going to read about in school. In The Origin of Species and Descent of Man, one of the passages in The Descent of Man, uh, Volume 2, 327, it says this, The chief distinction of the intellectual powers of the two sexes, in other words, between male and female, is shown by man attaining to a higher eminence in whatever he takes up than women can attain. Whether requiring deep thought, reason, or imagination, or merely the use of the sense of hands. In other words, what Darwin says in his book is basically that man is superior and has evolved further than woman in everything that he does. It also insinuates that black people are less evolved than whites. But I bet you're not going to learn about that in school from these books. When you take all of this together, the improbability and the impossibility of the Big Bang Theory and the theory of macroevolution or Darwinian evolution, when you see that they're neither observable or reproducible, they violate the law of biogenesis amongst other issues that they have, you have to come to the conclusion that they're wrong. So if they're wrong, that only leaves one other option, and that's that this universe was designed by a supernatural being or something outside of us. Some people refer to that as God, and they would be right because there is a very real God and he said in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and everything that God created was good people sometimes ask if God is good why is the world like it is today well if you read the book of Genesis God created a very good world just like you think he would the problem happened when sin entered in and that wasn't God's fault that was ours when we broke God's commandment when we violated his commands sin and death entered and that is the reason we live in the world that we live in today with sin sickness death and sorrow while we're on this earth that is never going to change but encouraging news is this is that God gives us a way out you see because of sin the Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God in Romans 3 23 he turned to Romans 6.23 and it tells us the actual punishment for that sin. It says the wages of sin is death. 
You see, our sin that we have earned separates us from God. And if we die in it, we will be eternally separated from God forever because God will punish us for our sins because he's a good and just God. The good news is, is that God does not want to punish us for our sins. He sent his only son, Jesus, to be punished in our place. God in the flesh willingly came down and took our punishment. The punishment that you and I deserved was actually laid upon Jesus. Now God tells us if we're willing to trust in Jesus, if we're willing to believe that is what he did, if what he did was enough, and we believe it with a heart that's willing to actually make him Lord of our lives, that faith in Jesus, that trust in him, God says he will remember our sin no more. If we truly do that, we will be forgiven of everything that we've ever done, and one day we will spend eternity with God in heaven. If you have any questions about that, please feel free to contact us at the Altar Church or go to our website, altarcda.com. You can click on Bible questions and you can look up links that say how to be forgiven or what is the gospel and it will explain that even more. God's Word also says, if you seek me, you'll find me. And if you really truly want to know God and be right with Him, then really with a sincere heart, seek Him with all your heart and you will find Him.